Well, thank you everybody for joining us today on Tuesday, um, February 2nd. We uh, have the pleasure of having Dr. Thomas Jakatsk. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm saying it correctly. <laughs> um, Thomas is an ENT doctor. He lives in Vilnius, uh, which is the capital of Lithuania. Um, and uh, he's going to share with us today the educational system in Lithuania. And he's also going to talk about the practice of ENT um, in his country. And for those who don't know the history, I believe it was 1991 that it's correct? 1990. 1990 that yeah, Lithuania yeah. broke away as a Soviet Republic from Russia. Because I knew yeah. was in 1991. So you guys were a year ahead. Um, from a study, yep. we, just as an introduction, from a study we did, the healthcare system, and please confirm this during your lecture, the healthcare system in Lithuania has advanced significantly compared to what it was prior to 1990. Whereas some countries, unfortunately, Ukraine has not advanced as rapidly as Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia um, post Soviet occupation. So yeah. I'll let you talk about that and so forth and so on. And we're, we're I'm, I'm very eager to hear about your country and your your education process. So thank you for joining us. All right, so thank you, Richard, for a nice introduction. I'll just share my screen uh, and try to share some things about my country and being an ENT in Lithuania. So, uh, uh, all right, I'll just... All right, so I'm an ENT doctor from Lithuania, still a young one. Uh, I finished my residency four years, almost four years ago right now. Um, and I work in the capital city, which I will tell a bit later. And yeah, so the outline, I think we all know what I'm going to talk about, about country, about community, med medical education, hospital I work in and the healthcare system in general and also the key challenges that we face, we're still facing, everyone faces in, in medicine. All right, so as Richard told, uh, Lithuania is one of the first Soviet countries to declare independence, and it was in 1990. And we joined the European Union and North Alliance Treaty uh, Organization in 2004. Uh, we declared our independence after mass protests, uh, which happened a few years before and it happened for a year uh, for a few years in a row and then we declared it but soviet tanks left our country only in 1993 so we had soviet army still present in lithuania for three years after we declared our independence so our country is quite small with neighboring country neighboring countries such as poland belarus we still have this small part which is russia which is Kaliningrad and people go from Russia tr transit through Lithuania to Kaliningrad and also our neighbors and brothers as we call them uh, Latvians. Uh, population is 2.8 million uh, people and it's been decreasing since 1991 when we had 3.7 million people. Uh, it's been decreasing because of immigration also mm, not so many newborns. Uh, the capital is Vilnius. We have three international airports, which apparently now are not operating that well as everything else, uh, which are in Vilnius, Kaunas and Palanga, which is considered to be Klaipeda uh, airport. These are the three biggest cities in our country and the country detail. So it's estimated that there are 46 doctors per 10,000 people, and there are around 300 ENTs, but uh, almost one fourth of them is older than retirement age. Um, we don't have those specialities, but people still specialize in some areas. Some are considered to be autosurgeons. 
the ones who do surgeries on, on ears. And also we have those otologists, which I think should be considered as audiologists uh, because they don't do any surgery, but uh, they work with people who have hearing impairment. Uh, we have lack of allied health professionals such as speech therapists, there are only few of them. Most of them are old also, and they're retiring. And uh, the capital is Vilnius, as, as I told. And I live here and I work here. You see here nice pictures of Vilnius in summertime and springtime. It's very nice. We have all the four seasons. Now it's winter time and we have a lot of snow and it was minus 20 a few weeks ago, but now it's minus nine. So it's quite nice and chilly outside. Um, there are around 600,000 people living in the city uh, and it's one of two cities in the whole country, which is still expanding, which population is growing. Uh, but in the metropolitan area, there's around 800, 850,000 people living. Um, there are around 10 hospitals in Vilnius County. I have in mind those hospitals which are not rehabilitation hospitals. They are like general hospitals, but they not necessarily have ENTs there working. Uh, but we have three major hospitals in the city. Uh, one university hospital and two partly university, partly uh, city hospital, municipality, I, I think that's how you should call them, hospitals. And there are around 60 ENTs working in Vilnius County. Uh, there are three to four autosurgeons, the ones who perform, of course, surgery on, on ears and a bit more of audiologists working in Vilnius and, and Vilnius County. We still have those nurses who perform uh, audiograms, but they're not, they can't, I, I don't think they can be considered to be audiologists. Uh, so how do you become an ENT in Lithuania? Well, first of all, you have to finish school. That is 12 years of school. You have to take some specific final exams. Uh, if you want to go to medicine, you have to take uh, national language, of course, uh, English, biology, chemistry, or maths, and combination of them. And then you get into medical university if your grades are high enough. Then we have six years of general medicine, which consists of five and a half years of medicine and half a year of internship. And then we take the final exams and the internship exam. And after that, it also depends on your grades, on your, on your six year grading, and also on the final exams, then you choose your speciality. Sadly, there's around 20% of students leaving to other European Union countries after medical university. Uh, it's a bit easier for us because we're a part of European Union. So our medical university is recognized in European Union. So we just have to learn the language and we can live quite freely. Most of our students leave to Germany, Switzerland, Austria. It used to be UK, but not anymore. Uh, so if you are lucky enough and, and get into ENT as I did, uh, you still have three years of residency program. Uh, they used to produce around six, seven residents per year, but now they increase, increase the numbers and now it's around eight, 10, it depends. If someone takes a, a leave for a year or something like that, then there's a, a bit less or a bit more, but it's, we have two universities who, who have residency programs um, and two hospitals. We can migrate in, in, in smaller hospitals also and have some, some things there, but uh, it's only two university hospitals who have them, one in Vilnius and one in Kaunas. Uh, and both of them have five residency spots, which are government paid. And if you, if you get, a, it's not a deal, but sometimes they have a, a spot where you have to pay for your tuition and it's around 
five, six thousand euros per year, I guess, something like that. So after finishing ENT, uh, we can do basic things such as tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy, tracheostomy, tympanostomy, basic nasal procedures, basic FES. It usually depends also on, on the resident and also on the teaching staff, how much they teach you, how much you engage in, in, in learning and going to courses and everything else. So some residents can do a bit more, some residents cannot do some stuff. And as I said, advanced training is a personal thing. So it depends. If you have the money, you can go to various courses and, 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 and learn things that you cannot learn during your residency. And after residency, it's the same. Uh, advanced training is a personal thing. So it's hard to say how, how, how many people will go abroad for, for learning. So the hospital I work in, it's the second biggest in town. It's, I think it's the third biggest in the whole country. It's the biggest emergency hospital in the whole country. We have the biggest flow of emergency uh, patients here. Uh, it used to be uh, called, so called to be traumatology center. It's not anymore. Uh, it's the whole system is a bit changing uh, and it's been changing since we since I, I'm not sure to, since we joined the European Union I guess there's a lot of equipment equipment which is being bought and and all the renovation of of buildings and new hospitals which are being built um, there are around 2,000 employees in our hospital um, yeah, and we have a separate uh, building for emergency unit, which is here. Not sure you can see my my pointer. Probably not. No, it's good. It's good, Thomas. Okay, perfect. So the unit I work in, um, all right, I'll just, yep. So we have 22 beds, so to say, uh, 22 places for for for, uh, for patients, but uh, in fact, sometimes we have more. We can do more. We, when it's necessary, we can have 28 patients, but it's rarely that it happens. We have 12 doctors working. Uh, only two of them work night shifts only because they work in other places. We have two dedicated rhinologists. Uh, two laryngologists, one autosurgeon, and five general ENTs. We have two audiologists who work in the outpatient clinic in audiology room, which I will show you a bit later. And we all work in outpatient clinic as a general consultant. So, yeah. Okay. So we have an, an operating room, which is quite small, uh, but we have all the necessary equipment, I guess. We have the endoscope with HD cameras, powered instruments, microscope. It's an old one, but I think they're trying to get a new one right now. But this microscope has been here for 12 years, I guess. Uh, we have one operating room, sadly. So we do around five, six surgeries per day. It depends, of course. We have one dedicated anesthesiologist. We used to have them changing all the time, but we decided that we have to have one, which is very specific for, for our specialty. So, so now we have one dedicated one and we can access to a uh, navigation system, which is in neurosurgery operating room, which is in our building. And sometimes we use it, but it's very rare because neurosurgeons use it all the time. So the outpatient clinic looks like this. There's new equipment. We bought it uh, two years ago, I guess. And we have all the necessary equipment, at least all, all the things that we needed at that moment. We have all the endoscopes, rigid and fiber optic, microscope, HD cameras, rhinomanometry, all the electrocautery and uh, radio frequency. And of course, MRI and CT are available. Uh, at the moment, we, the hospital doesn't have an MRI. 
but uh, there's another uh, company which is renting a place in a hospital which has MRI. So we send patients to them and it's some kind of deal because between the company and, and the hospital. So we wouldn't have to buy an MRI. But we have uh, free CT machines which work 24 seven. An audiology room looks like this. We have a audiology camera, uh, soundproof room, I mean, uh, all the necessary equipment there. There are two doctors who work there. Um, and of course they can refer patients to MRI and CT whenever needed. And also to, to, to consult an auto surgeon if needed. The emergency room looks like this. It's the oldest thing, I guess, in our unit. We, but we still have all the things we need, except the fiber optic uh, endoscope, of course. But uh, I think we can manage it with laryngoscope most of the time. And right about the healthcare system and and the ENT service in Lithuania. Well, there are. It's it's something of us familiar like Ukraine, we have those three levels of healthcare institution. Uh, first level is considered, considered to be polyclinics. Second level is regional hospitals. And we have around 44 of them in, in the whole country. It's been, a, it's changing at the moment. The number is decreasing. They're trying to centralize as much as they can and provide good transportation for patients, but there are still some, uh, some doubts about that. So it's around 44 at the moment. And we have the third level hospitals, which are national hospitals, and there are seven of them. And two are university centers where the cochlear implantation is being performed. And there are only two specialists who do it. Uh, I read an article a few days ago that uh, we do around, uh, it's been, I think it's 60 cochlear implantations, 60 patients. So it's, it's a bit more of cochlear implant, implants being used every year. Uh, and, and it is government funded, of course, it is, if uh, adult patients want to have it. Uh, if they need it, then there are some indications for it so that the government would compensate it, but uh, it's not always like that. But, so sometimes uh, patients pay themselves for that. And there are a rising number of private hospitals, but uh, they don't do uh, high-tech uh, surgeries. And the number is rising because the... Uh, some people are starting to get more and more uh, private insurance. We have the government insurance, of course, which is being extracted from our uh, salary. Uh, but there are some companies which offer, um, which offer private insurance. So you can use it in private hospitals also. And this brings us to the challenges that we are facing. Well, the healthcare funding, it's still sometimes unclear and insufficient. Well, we're a small country and it's always hard to get a lot of finances. Uh, it's unclear because every time the government changes, every time the, the focus of the funding changes. So it's always hard to get enough money for everything we want, but I think it's the problem. It's, this is a problem in every country that, uh, healthcare system is not funded enough. And uh, we have weak organizations and shady management. Uh, <laughs> I wrote this because we have those organizations uh, of healthcare uh, professionals like ENT, National ENT Organization, National Surgery Organization and everything else. We pay them taxes, but uh, where does the money go? We're not sure, not always sure. And it is a bit shady sometimes. Uh, nepotism is still common. Uh, it's not very common in high level. Uh, it's usually tied with uh, going into residency 
um, or, or going into some program you want or getting some funding that you need, it's not necessary becoming a, a head of, of a unit or something like that. It doesn't happen like, like that anymore, but, but still getting trained and everything else, there is still signs of nepotism there. And training is quite inconsistent. We don't have those skills, lab, skills labs that uh, some other universities have. We don't have funding for our trips to other courses. We don't have those courses that we have to take. Uh, also, as I said, there are two universities, two university hospitals who produce residents. And on paper, so to say, the program is the same, but the training is totally different. And it's not always the same things that we learn after finishing residency and it's very unequal. And I think there are too many ENTs. It's around one ENT for 10,000 people. I think it's too many and they produce too many residents at the moment. So I'm not sure what is the idea with that, but, but we'll see in a few years. So this brings me to questions and answers. If you have any questions, hopefully I mentioned everything that was interesting. If you have some more interest, just ask me. I will try to answer them. Uh, Thomas, thank you very much uh, for sharing your country with us. Um, let me ask you a question. Uh, is head and neck surgery, carotid surgery, thyroid surgery, laryngectomy, is that done by ENTs or is it done by general surgeons? Yeah, that's a good question, Richard. Well, uh, laryngectomy, that's uh, done by ENTs. Okay. Uh, some of the parotids, they are done by ENTs or maxillofacial surgeons. But the thyroid, it's, it's usually general surgeons who do it. We can do it also. It is in our license to, to, to perform this surgery, but it's not many specialists who do it. I know that there are some who do it, but it's not so many patients who come to us because of thyroid surgery, because of the things that we inherit from Soviet Union. I, I think that's the problem in post-Soviet countries that it was the general surgeons who, who did it then, so they still do it. It's changing. Here, we can feel that, but it's still, it is what it is. Yeah, in some countries, like in the United States, some general surgeon, thyroids and head and neck is ENT. You still find some general surgeons doing thyroid parotids, but it's fewer and fewer because the general surgery training programs, unless they have a focus on head and neck surgery, because yeah. their chairman is interested, they usually don't focus too much on it. So it's really been captivated by the ENT community. You go to a country like uh, Peru or El Salvador, ENTs don't do any head and neck. They don't touch any of the head and neck surgery whatsoever. Um, it's either done by general surgeons or a specialty called head and neck surgeons. All right, yeah. Yeah, so th that's interesting. Um, Another thing that was interesting, your country's only got like 3 million people. Uh, yes. Ukraine's got quite a few, like almost 40 million, I believe. And you have almost equal number of surgeons that are doing, we, you call them otosurgeons, we'll call them otologists for the sole purpose of this conversation. Yep. But you've got about the same number of otologists that in a country of one, uh, 3 million as Ukraine. 40 million. million. Yeah. 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 It's, it's interesting. And, and I do agree with your comment that, you know, if you have one ENT per 10,000, that is, that is a very high number. I believe in the United States, it's more like about 20,000, maybe 25, one yeah. 20 to 25,000. Um, temporal bone labs. Do you have a, you don't have any temporal bone lab at all in the country or do you? No, 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 we don't have it. We sometimes get courses. Uh, I mean, our professors, sometimes they, they, they organize some courses with either 3D printed uh, temporal bones or, or they get, they harvest some temporal bones. It's, it's usually, it's because of the legal base, I guess. 
uh, that we cannot get uh, temporal bones. So it's we have to order them from our countries and it is very expensive. It's, it's easier to go to some courses in, in other country. Understood. Um, what else? Does anybody else have any questions to, uh, for Thomas? Uh, here we have a question, it's in the chat. What is the prevalence of chronic, well, let me find that question. Or chronic infections of the year. Okay, do you see the question, Thomas? Yeah, yeah, I can see it. It's okay, can yeah. You read it to everybody and then they answer yeah. it for us. All right. What is the prevalence of chronic infections of the ear? Probably there. Well, it's uh, it used to be quite often, but now it's it, it's not that often because we have so many ENTs working and all the equipment is changing, and we have those uh, and the hospitals are quite. Uh, available for patients so it's it's decreasing also uh, cannot tell an exact number uh, but also there's a changing view to adenoid surgery and and, and early detection of ear infections in, in childhood and also we have that program of uh, ear uh, of hearing uh, after birth so we we, we, we try to catch those uh, hearing impairments uh, quite early after birth. Thomas, um, otosclerosis, okay. You see much of it in Lithuania? It's not that often. Yeah, we see that, but it's not that often. We get, we, we do, I guess, in our hospital, we do around, uh, 60, 50 per year. Okay. And then, so, okay. Um, yeah. What about, are the majority of ENTs women, or men, or it's about equal? It's women, definitely. It's around, I guess, 70, 30. 70% of ENT surgeons are women. Yes. It's, they're not, they're, we have those, ENTs who work only in polyclinics. So that's also, I didn't mention that because the ones who work in hospital and do surgery, it's also 70, 30, probably. So 70 of them, just 70% of them just work in polyclinic and do consultations and refer to other ENTs. And 70, 30, that's also the ratio for women and men. And then another question, do you, are there doctors, are any ENT doctors do they have private practices outside of working for the government? Yeah, yeah, that's quite common. Uh, some of them work in private hospitals, which are, yeah, uh, but some of them have their own uh, rooms where they just consult ENT patients and that's it. It's not, this type of uh, consulting is not that common, but there are few doctors I know that they have this practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the training, the training scheme that you identified, you know, going through 12th, the 12th grade, and then six years of um, six years of medical school, and then three years of training for ENT. It's very yeah. comparable to the American method. Um, although recently, they added another year on. When I trained, which was a long time ago, um, I had college four years, medical school four years, and then had internship and two years of internship, and then three years of ENT, okay? Right. Three years. Now it's five years of ENT, all right? So, um, you know, things have, things have changed to a degree. Um, just it's a longer training, it's more exposure, but the hours are less because we have laws in the United States that limit the number of hours you can work consecutively. Yeah. If you're on call one night, you don't work the next day. Okay. Yeah, the same here. We have that also. It's not always that we keep that, but it's it, it, it we have that law also. Yeah, they are trying to change the system here also. They, there have been attempts to change it at least to four years, but it, it goes to finances at the end of the day. 
And if they finance this program, they have to take some finances from other programs. So it's always hard to, to get the money, to get the funding for, for ENT, which is a bit uh, forgotten uh, thing here in Lithuania. It's, it's rising again, but it's, we have so many ENTs, nobody is looking to an ENT like uh, something special. And the main language is Lithuanian, but do, is it half Lithuanian, half Russian or what? It's not half Russian. Uh, it's around, uh, it is more common in Vilnius County that there are more Russians or, Pol or Pol Polish speaking people. It's not exactly the same Polish that they speak in Poland. It's a bit different Polish. Um, and it's around maybe 30, 70 in Vilnius County, but in the whole country, it's, it's less. It's, it's probably 80, 20, 85, 15, something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But people speak Russian quite well anyway. Uh -huh. uh, we have Agata who's, she's from Poland. She's on this platform today. Uh, Agata, if you have any questions, you're, the na you're a neighboring, almost a neighboring country to, uh, yeah, Ag Agata wrote a question about, oh, okay. uh, probably it's about the night shifts. Well, I said that two doctors have night duty only, but uh, I meant that they don't work in the, they, they don't work the days in our unit. They just have the night shifts and that's it. They work in other hospitals or other polyclinics, but we also, the other doctors all, also have night shifts. So there are 12 doctors who change in the night shifts, but two of them work only night shifts and don't work during the day, so. Uh, Misha's from London, he's with us today. Misha, do you have any questions uh, from London? Yes, I do. Thanks very much for, um, for your fantastic talk, Thomas. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, the first question is sort of allied to what you've already been asked, which is about specifically related to cancer um, in any part of ENT, if a, if a doctor in your unit diagnoses a cancer or suspects a cancer, is there any sort of centralized organization for the management of those patients? I'm referring to the American style tumor boards or the British style multidisciplinary teams, or can each individual doctor treat the cancer as he or she sees fit? That's first question, first question. And the second one was- and the second one was- uh, Radio frequency and rhino manometry um, in your clinic. I just wondered what you use those things for those regularly things for in your regular regular clinic. Uh, good questions. <laughs> well, um, about uh, cancer patients. Well, we don't do cancer surgery in our hospital. We have those uh, cancer centers where we refer our patients if we diagnose them with cancer. We just take biopsy, we do CT, MRI, whatever needed, and then we refer them to cancer hospitals or, or units where uh, they do cancer surgery. And there are only two of them in the whole country. There are still some people who perform uh, surgery on cancer patients in, EN in the field of ENT, in other hospitals also, but uh, now the law has changed and we have to use the multidisciplinary teams to consider what is the best for the patient before we try to do surgery even. So if, if a patient has cancer and is referred to a cancer hospital and they have a head and neck cancer and they require surgery, for example, is that done by an ENT in that cancer yeah. hospital? Yes, usually, usually, yes. They usually have uh, a team consisting of more than just an ENT. But, well, if it's just laryngectomy without any, uh, any uh, additional things, then, then it's ENT who does it. But if, if there's also some things that have to be done more, then we have other specialty, specialties coming in, like plastic surgeons, uh, maxillofacial surgeons and everyone else. And is there a trend towards offering surgical treatment for laryngeal cancer or, or is chemo and radiotherapy available as well? Yeah, it depends. Well, it is available, of course. We have 
I'm not sure right now what are the trends because I don't work with that anymore. It was only in my residency, but uh, we had more of probably more of performing surgery than doing uh, radiotherapy or chemotherapy for uh, laryngeal cancer. But it always depends on, on the patient. And usually we have those patients who, who are neglected quite because of smoking and, and living in rural areas and they come in quite late. So, yeah. Thank you, Thomas. Um, I don't know whether you caught my second question there, because it's- Yeah, you know, I got it, but I forgot it. So if you could repeat it. <laughs> all right, so, so you mentioned in your clinic, you have radio frequency available and also rhino manometry. And I just wondered what you regularly use that for. Yeah, rhino manometry, we don't use that very regularly. Um, they bought it because it was part of, of the equipment, uh, equipment that they ordered. Uh, we sometimes use it for patients who already had sur nasal surgery, but they uh, have some symptoms of, of poor breathing through their nose. So, so we just check it if it's, if it's equally on both sides or, or there are some, some disturbances on one side. But I use it very rarely. Just I've used it, I don't know, 10, 10 times. We're trying to do a, um, a clinical trial uh, with patients who get um, uh, turbinoplasty because we have this uh, uh, freezing technique that we use with... Uh, cryosurgery. Yeah, 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 cryosurgery. And also we have the radio frequency. So we try to evaluate the effect of, of, of that. So it's basically just for for uh yeah how to say that <laughs> my english just broke <laughs> your your english is excellent it's, it's considerably better than my lithuanian so thank you for <laughs> yeah but it's it's uh, renal manometry is not very useful in our clinic and radio frequency yeah we do turbinoplasty sometimes sometimes we do it for the soft palate for patients who snore I don't use it very often because I don't have that flow of patients, but I just know what other doctors do sometimes. Thank you very much, Thomas. I really enjoyed your lecture. Thank Next, you. Do you have any questions from Paraguay? Nestor. Hold on a second. And Nestor wrote the uh question on the chat. He's got a little connectivity issue. Did you get a question? Oh, no, th th uh, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Thomas. Jorge, uh, is from, Jorge, is the, Jorge is from Asuncion, Paraguay. He's the director of the otology training program. Uh, Jorge, thank you for joining. Uh, ask any, if you have a question, please ask it. No, only, only thank. thank. Thanks for, for Thomas, very interesting. Uh, thank you. Uh, Maybe I will go to uh, Lithuania for <laughs> us, for know you personally. <laughs> yeah, you're very welcome. Okay. You're all welcome here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, unless there's any other questions for today, um, Thomas, I want to thank you for sharing, you know, your, the educational program and the services that are available in Lithuania. I'll, I'll have to admit that your country is very advanced, at least from the infrastructure point of view. Um, yeah. You know, from the manpower, you seem like you have a lot of ENTs. Um, you have subspecialties within the field. Um, you know, it, I'm sure that it, in the future as things develop, you know, there might even be advanced training programs like fellowships. Uh, you know, it's just gonna be a matter of time and, and uh, but you guys have a really, really well, well built infrastructure, irrespective of the, you know, what's the word, the variations in the government, um, in the government on a annual basis. Um, and um, I, I really thank you for taking the time to share this with us. Yeah, thank you. It was a great pleasure to talk. Um, 
let's see what Misha just said one thing here. Hold on a minute. Such a good idea to have these country profiles. Misha wants to say he thinks it's a good idea. I do too. And that's why we have you here today. Um, I'm looking forward to coming to Lithuania. We've talked about this before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As when this COVID's over and I go to Ukraine again, I'm gonna try to try to go to Lithuania and then down to Poland. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about helping you guys put on a course there and bring a colleague or two of mine from Italy who speak fully full English. None of us speak Russian or Lithuanian, <laughs> um, but I'm sure that we could, you know, on a global level, have a have a really nice educational course to, you know, and work with you and, and some of the other faculty. Okay, uh, so it's um, be great. Thank you very yeah. much. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us, and we we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Bye, everyone. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Bye-bye.